Hello everyone. Welcome to live class number four. Yeah, this is the fourth week, sorry. Um, I was distracted because thanks to you, I have John Denver's Country Road on repeat in my head, the chorus specifically. And it's creating this very nice atmosphere complete with, uh, with a cup of hot apple cider. It's cool outside. And all of that has put me in a great mood for today. So that's partly due to you. Thank you. Um, that was one of my favorite pre-stream chats when we started belting the course to Country Road. So anyway, welcome. Uh, today we are doing the last, um, well, we're technically going to do another live stream to wrap up this class, but this is the last, like, very uh, particularly instructional um, session for BC4 1810 Shading and Lighting with Blender. Um, we'll get right into it because uh, sometimes I wonder if I talk too much, so I'm going to try and go a little faster. Um, we were going to get right into week three, uh, the recap of um, my favorites uh, from uh, last week's homework. And the assignments were character renders, as you saw, of course, from the reel. Um, thank you, Kate, for putting that together. Um, always, that's so appreciated. You know, we, it's a highlight of, of each stream, of each class stream. So thank you for doing that. Um, I think Wes popped his head in. He, he sent me a personal message through our company chat, how much he likes watching those. And then I think he popped his head in here. So yeah, it's, a, it's such a cool thing, such a cool way to start off. I know I say that every time, but I want you to know that it's very appreciated. So thank you, Kate. And um, yeah, incredible work uh, this week. As usual, I always say that, right? Um, maybe one class will have just nothing but bad work and I won't have to say that anymore, but um, you guys uh, have not made that the case. But I'm gonna go through some of my uh, more memorable character renders and light matches first. Um, here we've got a render from Carolyn uh, Perez Hempfill. And um, this is, is a very pleasing, like model centric. If you remember that genre that I talked about from last week, it's, it's very focused on the model. It accentuates all the shape and form very well. The, the rim light's strong. You know that I'm a big fan of the rim light, so I'm always gonna point it out when I see a strong one that really makes the character pop off the background. It's, yeah, this looks great. Similarly, Kate, um, your, your character, which I think you said you got from Sketchfab, so that's pretty cool that those kind of models are available for us to light and render. Um, but you did a, a great job with this one as well. Very strong, uh, heroic type rim light and, and lighting in general, which fits the character very, very well. It accentuates the model. It's a great showcase. Mal Holmesy, you went way, way above and beyond and completely textured. Well, maybe you had this model laying around before the class, but you presented a fully textured, very skillfully textured material, uh, materialized model. So um, excellent work there. And um, I'm going to get around to the fact that your lighting is simple, but I think that that works for this render. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, but um, this definitely stood out as a very finished, final, um, polished character render. So good job there. Um, Oh, in case anyone's new, I, we probably don't have too many new people in here at this point, but you know, you can ask questions. That's, that's a big benefit of this live stream format. So please ask any questions that you have. Omar, I'm expecting some from you since you are talking about lighting, interior lighting being difficult. Um, but yeah, just be sure to add the question prefix to the beginning. That should be old news by now, but just in case you don't know, um, that helps me find it better in the chat. Um, all right, so I think I have another round of character renders. Omar is determined to make it onto these uh, these favorite uh, lists, and Omar, you did a great job with with the character lighting. You um, with this goblin, you did several first of all, so you explored uh, different varieties. I thought that was great. It was cool to see where your mind was at when you were doing various types of lighting, achieving certain uh, types of effects. And this one up top was probably my favorite. This goblin um, lit kind of it reminded me of like a uh, like a fantasy movie or video game like a blizzard cinematic if you've if you've never um if you've never seen those the one i'm thinking of specifically let's go find that real quick uh blizzard um cataclysm if you've never seen the cataclysm trailer um first of all it's awesome and it's super epic check that out but i'm just going to skip real quick um to what it reminds me of is this type of lighting where you know it's this dragon in like a volcano and so it's got this very very 
epic type feel to it. Anyway, that's what I got from, from this type of render. And so the, the model's particularly like gray and neutral, but the fact that you've got a very strong, bright orange rim light uh, and backlight, uh, it, it produces this very, very um, pleasing contrast. There's also a blue fill on the right side and even bits of, of green in the lighting as well that I assume is from the environment map. But awesome, awesome, super strong, super heroic render. Love what you did with that one. And I also liked your, your stylized character. Another example of like fully textured and um, shaded version. Um, and you were able to, I'm gonna get to it in a moment, but I like your controlled lighting in that situation. So really good job. Yeah, Diablo, or I also I was thinking of The Hobbit. Like uh, there's a the scene where they like are in an underground uh, like chase sequence with goblins, I think, if I remember correctly. But that type of, of fantasy lighting, that's what this represented, and it's it's very powerful. So good job. Mahir, you're, um, you, I mean, if this is your, I'm curious if you're here, maybe not, um, but where you got this model, because it's a, a very high quality model. And if you modeled this on your own, that certainly deserves some, some um, commendation. But the lighting as well, it's got this very, um, kind of airy, sort of ethereal nature to it. It's got, like I almost want to say heavenly, given it's very white, um, and it's it's got uh, a very pleasing, strong rim light, even despite the uh, the cape, which I think is cool. Maybe that's Fresnel, or maybe that's just a, a clever way that you lit it. But um, very, very strong, um, a unique type of render. You know, it's it's very different from the from Omar's over here, which is very vibrant, bright colors, high contrast. This one is, um, again, like I get the word like airy, but it works really, really well. Even though it's a, a lighter color in general across the whole render, it still pops off the background. Um, very, very good work here, Mahir. Oh, you are here, awesome. A model from Sketchfab. I mean, this is cool that Sketchfab, again, I only discovered Sketchfab as a source for 3D models very recently. And yeah, before like it was, it just wasn't that common to be able to find models like this to be able to practice shading and lighting. So Mahir, you took a great model and you made it even better with an awesome lighting job. So good stuff. So those are my, I think, favorite character renders. Now for their light matches, Ahmed, um, this, I remember this one, um, I'm not sure if you got it from my collection, but it's in my collection. So I like this, this very type of orange stylistic uh, model presentation and you matched it super close, um, really, really closely. So awesome work there. Uh, uh, Silent Heart, I really like this render enough that I, I copied the source and put it in my uh, my collection as well because I had not seen this before. And it's got a very unique style that you matched really well. You know, the, the warm orangish yellow, uh, it looks like that's, it's almost like there's two key lights. So it's it, the, the yellowish one coming from the left side. And then there's a blue, maybe fill light, and then a green kind of rim light and those that color progression I don't see very often but it works really really well and you matched it extremely closely so awesome job silent on that one um Kate uh you you make it again and I mean this thing looks super close I know you got some helpful feedback that you applied and took it up just one more notch to be I, I think virtually indistinguishable from from the source you know like it absolutely looks like two different models rendered in the exact same scene yeah, super close. Really impressed how how we are able to analyze, how everyone here is able to analyze the the lighting and then match it. That's a, that's a cool skill. I hope you guys are learning in addition to just how to match it, but also taking away like key points like, oh, that's where the rim light really worked in that source. I, I, I investigated it. I'm going to remember that for the future. Or this color scheme actually works really well. I never thought of it. Since I matched it, I'm going to remember that. That's the idea. Um, behind this exercise and Mahir, again, you make it with um, um, a very close match. The only the only feedback I would give is that the red seems a little bit stronger on the left side in the source, but still like just focusing on the goblin itself, um, very, very, uh, I mean, rim light, you guys are probably sick of hearing it, but like I love that strong rim light, really makes the character pop. And um, um, it's an interesting, I've never really seen this, I don't think, where on the character's face, you've got this stark shadow kind of crossing over it. So that was interesting. I'd, I'd never seen that before. I do think it works, but it could be dangerous too. Anyway, I mean, that uh, you, you did a great job matching. That's kind of the point, but um, yeah. 
just an observation. So is that it? No, I have a couple more. John Sanderson, this is one of my favorite light mat or uh, sources. I, I think I saved that as well in my collection. Um, and I mean, I'm a big fan of Zelda, but it, regardless, like you got really close to the match on the, on your, your goblin and um, colors match really well. It's got that same model centric type feel to it. Just good stuff. And Carolyn, I wanted to highlight your light match because what not everybody did is is match the background in addition to the lighting, which which I was kind of looking for that. I'm, I'm hoping that people go be mindful of the background, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit as well. But um, you did that. You you lit it very closely. Um, you know, it's a different model. You got a character and you got a hand, which can be an immediate disconnect. But since you filled out the background, I think that connected it back to the original and um, it's better for it. So I, I appreciate and I, I, I appreciate that you did that and you put attention on the object being lit and also the background. So excellent work there. Um, I saw a question from Marco. Is it possible to have correction or on original files for light matching exercise? Is it possible to have correction on original files for light matching exercises? Um, oh, are you talking about... Um, are you asking if you can provide your file and then me or or other people like um, modify that file to get to get a closer light uh, match? Um, I definitely see the the benefit in that. I also can see it being kind of a time suck for uh, well, definitely for me. But um, so I don't know. Maybe, but like it would be hard to offer that for everybody. Um, so I don't know. Get back to me. I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. I would, initially, I would say probably not. It, offer it, and if if I find the time or if someone else takes it, okay, that is what you're asking. Um, I say offer the file and, and say, like, if anyone's willing to do that, I'd, I'd appreciate it. But um, um, it is it is a, 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 a generous request, I would say. Um, so no guarantees that, that I or other people will be able to, to do that. Let me see if I'm missing any other questions. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, okay, so one of the favorite light matches. Let's go on to... Okay, so some lessons that I wanted to reiterate because I found myself giving similar feedback on several people's uh, uh, homework, including previous weeks. And so I wanted to kind of nail those home one more time um, or, or for, the, for the class as, as a whole. And the first one is value spectrum because a few renders were um, notably dark, uh, just very, very dimly lit. And I and I didn't really know why, I guess, you know, um, because to me it just registers as like, wow, that's just way too dark, I can barely see it. But I also realized that maybe for the person who made it, their, the way that their computer screen is, is, is exposing the image or the way that they're just used to seeing maybe dimmer lit stuff, I don't know, but um, maybe that looked normal for them. Um, so I wanted to point out the fact that like there are tools that can can objectively measure where in the value spectrum your image is at. And for this one in particular, um, it, it just, it looked pretty decent. And, and you can see that when I increase the levels to a more like a mid-level range that it, it looks very good. Um, I'm surprised that even the source image seemed to, to be so dark. Um, but if you're experiencing, like, if you're wondering where in the value spectrum am I taking advantage of and where am I uh, neglecting, in Photoshop, in um, this is the Photoshop levels adjustment. You can also get the same levels adjustment in GIMP and Krita. So it's pretty common in image applications to get a levels adjustment. And you can see that, well, the way that this graph works uh, from the left is like your, your black values. So see that as zero. And then the, the upper value, see that as one. Now they, you know, I think in RGB, it goes zero to 255 or whatever color space measurement that is. Um, but you can see it at the bottom, black to white. And in your image, all of the data is in the lower, the initial um, third of the graph, all right? So it's, there's two thirds that is getting virtually no data. And so that just means that, that ideally you will be able to take advantage of, of the larger spectrum. Or, or not favor completely black or completely white. You want some mid-levels in there. Um, so that's a way to objectively measure. And um, 
And, uh, oh, there's also tools in Blender. We can go over that really quick. There's a question. Um, render, op render optimization using branch path tracing versus path tracing. I noticed that using branched path tracing renders gets cleaner. Um, would be nice to know how to optimize better avoiding oversampling and wasting time. Um, definitely, definitely. That's something to cover. It's kind of a big nerdy topic to really dive in and and figure out how to tweak um, those specific settings. It's also very relative to the scene. So that's a stream or a, or a tutorial we should definitely make. I'm not gonna be able to do that today. There's a lot of other things that I wanna talk about that I think are more important um, because ultimately this you know optimization is important. Um, but optimization doesn't make great renders. It's how to it's how to make great renders faster, basically. So today I'm just going to focus on like how to make um, good renders is the idea. Um, but uh, that is definitely a good suggestion, and I'm glad we need to, to take care of that one for sure. Um, is there a way to use a spotlight on top to highlight a character? Is there a way to use a spotlight on top to highlight a character? I mean, yeah, you can use a spotlight, and that would certainly add highlights to the character. Maybe I don't understand what you mean. Is there a way to, it's not like a trick. You just add a spotlight and then see what happens. You know, um, I personally don't use a lot of spotlights anymore. I use area lights, but you know, spotlights are, are fine. A uh, question. Does it blender have a tool that illustrates levels like that? Thank you. Yeah, it does. So I, you know, I took that image. Um, initial thought was taken into Photoshop and or that's where I was adjusting it. And then I snapshotted the levels, but in blender, let's jump over there. And I'm gonna to jump to the UV image editor and just open some images. Um, desktop. Let's see what we have. Oh, I think I actually have those particular renders. If I sort by date, maybe. I thought I did. Oh. Nuts. I am trying to open an image, right? Was it temp maybe? Yeah, here we go. Here we go, these are the image. So that's the same image I was just talking about, the dark original version. And if we open the T panel inside the UV image editor, you get some what they call scopes or measurement tools for adjusting or for um, being able to visualize your the values in your image. And so here we can see similarly to Photoshop, you've got all your data um, really pushed low into that lower spectrum. All right, so there's a ton. In this case, it looks like, you know, three fourths, if not like four fifths, sorry, it is like not being utilized at all. You can also draw a sample line. I think this is interesting, where when you draw a line across the image, you know, from left to right, think of the grid as left to right as the same as this line. And you can see, you know, it's black. And so the value is really low. And then as I get to a lighter portion, it pops up. And so you can visualize, you know, by drawing different lines across the image, you know, what um, what your values are like kind of dynamically as, and you can measure those very intuitively. And as I kind of drag this line across the entire image, you can see that that the values never jump up beyond, you know, like like a quarter of the of the uh, vertical um, range. So that just means that the image is definitely underutilizing value spectrum. If we open up that other image, Um, boom, boom, this one. So I just quickly adjusted the the levels. We are getting, you know, as I drag across the image, you can see that our spikes are much higher. They're not all the way to white, which um, I'm a little confused about because if I like, is it right click? Yeah, if you right click and move your mouse over the any image in the UV image editor, you can see at the bottom, if you look right down here as I do that, you'll see that we get pixel data um, for wherever my mouse is at. And you can hover over your bright area and it says it's a value of one. So I don't really, um, it's maybe something I don't understand about the, the, gr the graph itself, but you would think that at a pixel value of one, you know, it, it would be jumping up to the top, but I don't really understand all the ins and outs. It just, what you, what I want you to take away is that you can clearly see that this is utilizing more of the value spectrum than it was previously. So you know, get, you know, maybe look up Google some about these, the histogram waveform and, and whatever this uh, the vector scope, which I don't even know what that does, frankly. Um, I don't know how to read that one, but yeah, use these tools to be able to objectively 
measure if your scene is too bright or not bright enough. I think that'll be a good tool uh, because I did see that a few times um, on various various uh, homework submissions. Question, thank you for understanding. Uh, I understand it's time consuming. Maybe you could provide some of your light matching exercise. Oh, sure. I mean, I can definitely provide my, um, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that, Marco. Um, if you don't see that happen in the next week, maybe ping me in, in your thread or in the main class thread and just say, hey, asking again, can you can we get your, your light match files? And I will absolutely um, provide those. Uh, question does blender have okay yeah question spotlight tricks oh thank you for the information on levels to work great on that spotlight tricks uh i'm not sure what you mean by spotlight tricks what i do want to show you in the demo is how to how to kind of fake ies lights um but but that's we'll get to there um a little bit later my hoodie is making me hot. Um, if I, that sounds like maybe what you mean by spotlight tricks, like it, it I think so. It, um, maybe wait till we get to that point and, and see if that answers your question. Um, otherwise, I'll need more context about what spotlight tricks means. Um, value spectrum, a couple other lessons. Um, we're already 20 minutes in. Sorry, I, I don't mean to. Um, if YouTube comments have taught me anything, it's that I talk too much. So, um, I apologize, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and go faster, but there is kind of a lot to discuss. Uh, week three lessons, color too much of a good thing. This is another note that I, I, uh, I don't know, I kind of had to relearn myself because to your credit, let's start over. Um, I was very strong about not being afraid of color in your lighting. Um, and to your credit, you guys, uh, took that information and you applied it very well. No, very few people were could be um, deemed afraid of color. You guys were being very bold with your color choices, and I really wanted to make sure you didn't experience what when I was fearful of that um, and just you know uh, insecure about being more bold with color choices. So you guys did that. Um, however, these examples right here represent maybe too much of that good thing. And particularly because you, you added that color um, approach to the materials themselves. Um, looking back, I maybe didn't make that clear, but, but I was particularly referring to um, lights, lamp objects, maybe even environment light. Your light sources themselves, I, want, I wanted to make sure that you were not afraid to saturate them and be bold with them. And so you guys did that, but you also made the materials bold and they tended to clash in that, in that result. And, and it kind of ventures over into this kind of rainbow uh, color palette, which is difficult to pull off. You don't see a lot of rainbow color palettes very often, maybe in a nature scene, because naturally, you know, in a, in a big wide open spring environment, there's gonna be a rainbow of colors, but like in a character render, rainbow's hard to pull off. Um, uh, so what I did is I desaturated these images and uh, it ends up, you can tell the values a little bit more clearly and it, and it looks pretty good. Like these are, uh, this one's maybe a little bit too bright and blown out on the head and the skin material, but in general, these look a little bit better desaturated. They're not, there's not just so much going on. So basically the, the notes that I gave to you is that, that to these, the people um, that I want to pass on to everybody is that consider, you know, this isn't a hard, fast rule, but if you have a gray model, that opens the door to be very bold with your light choices. And we've seen examples of that throughout the, the month. Um, I wonder if I can find that real quick. Let me see. Because the one that is obvious on my mind right now is, let's see, this one. Yeah, this one. So this is an example of a, a, a gray model, but with a ton of light. And it's, and it's not quite rainbowy. You know, we've got cyan, we've got uh, red, we've got bright orange, bright purple, um, maybe a little bit of yellowy orange, but we don't have like really anything in the green spectrum. So it is an isolated, though large part of the color wheel. It's not quite rainbow. I just, I would recommend against a rainbow type effect 
where you have like virtually all colors, all the main colors of the rainbow in your render. That's just very hard to make appealing. Um, and so in that case, you know, you have a gray model and then you paint it with light, basically. Alternatively, if we go back to uh, this example, um, Malholmsy has a very colorful textured, com um, completely textured character model, and he goes subtle with the lights. It's basically white light, which works because they're not uh, conflicting. If he had gone with like a bright green light and a bright purple light, that might have conflicted. So, so if you have a colorful model, I recommend being more subtle with your colored lights. If you've got a gray or very subtly colored model, consider going bold with your colors and the lights. That's what I want you to take away from that. Um, see if I'm missing anything else. Awesome, we will go over IES lights and talk about that. Okay, so I am missing some questions. Let me get to these. Question, did you ever uh, light an interior when you use 3D Studio Max and Maya using V-Ray maybe? Yes, I'm gonna show you uh, an image that I did for a job uh, that I used 3ds Max and V-Ray. Um, yeah, so I have done that before. When do you use a spotlight instead of an area light? Uh, very rarely, honestly. Um, the only times off the top of my head when I would definitely use a spotlight is if I was trying to create uh, like a stage lighting scene, you know, if, uh, for a demo reel, for my demo reel back in, in the day, um, I did a, a, a musician playing a guitar and so I, I lit him with stage lights and in that situation, I would use spotlights because that's the most um, uh, correct um, emulation of a real spotlight. Uh, but that's a very specific situation. General character lighting, I don't really use a spotlight. Um, I just never needed it, um, basically. Um, I think <laughs> I hope you guys are all right with with how much I talk. I, I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that in the uh, in the clock, in the closing, uh, what do you call it? Survey, just to judge like if I am talking a little too much, but anyway. Um, so yeah, color too much of a good thing. I think I only have a couple more, um, almost a half hour into it. Uh, ground plane termination. This is another thing that I see very often, um, especially I saw it this, this week as well, but as you can see, this render is from week two and I saw it there a lot as well. And it's just this, this uh, kind of, involuntary oversight, it's very easy to do, where you add a ground plane, which is has a lot of practical reasons. I use a ground plane frequently. It's just a quick way to get a ground. Um, but then when you render, you leave it, you, you leave the edge very, very visible. So I think this is a good render, but it, it's, it sucks that it's such a sharp end to the ground plane. It immediately disconnects the viewer from a chance at believing this image. Um, so that's a, that's an easily avoidable thing. You can, even with this same geometry, you can enable depth of field and significantly blur out the edge with the environment. And that's exactly what Omar did here. He's using a ground plane as well. And he, he adds a lot of depth of field, which depth of field is pleasing. You know, it has connection to photography and our, you know, human brains are a little more um, aware of that, you know, where we accept that. And so it, it looks higher quality to in, uh, introduce depth of field. And it also has a very practical ability to blur out the edge. And it's just a more, um, we eliminate that disconnection. That's kind of the point. I saw it a lot. Um, so be mindful of the ground plane termination. Along with that is this idea of a disconnected background and foreground. Um, so on the images on the left, they, the thing that they share in common is that there is no ground plane. There is no point of contact between the character and a ground. And so it's kind of floating in a very weird kind of way, in a way that feels very computer generated. This is clearly not something that could ever be thought of as real or, or believable. Um, and and uh, it has this cut and paste feel. Now with the black background, I understand that with, with, with Blender, um, unless you put an environment in there, it's going to render black or put an environment color. Um, it's going to render black or whatever color you choose. And so it's easy to focus on just the character and not care about the background. Um, but that always feels like a work in progress. I do it too, I did it last week in the stream where I left the background completely black and unattended to. Um, I didn't mean to suggest that that was a final render, but it's it's the work in progress stage. And it's okay to share renders with, with people in a team or whatever in that work in progress state. 
but on your portfolio, like a final, final image, that looks uh, like lazy, basically. Um, and and then, so that's the black one. And then the, the, the seemingly random color in the background is also, has that same feeling, but, but the fact that the, ba the background here is like a dark navy bluish purple, and we see nothing that's navy blue on the character itself. So there's no interaction between the background and the character. It looks like it's just been cut, uh, cut and pasted from totally different sources. And that's another disconnect that um, doesn't, it, it's not the best way to do it. Um, on the bottom two images, they are better in that there is some effort put into the background and they match like the colors make sense and match with the lighting of the character, but we are missing the ground plane. Now, do, am I saying always use a ground plane? No, in the first stream I used, um, I, I eliminated the ground plane. Uh, I, I started with one and then I pushed the cylinder down and uh, eliminated the ground plane because it was a, it was a crab claw and there was no, no um, obvious uh, reason to have it sitting on the ground. Whereas with this character or any character or creature that has feet, like if they, if it looks like they should be standing on a ground, I highly recommend that you put a ground in there. This, this goblin character is a very good example. Um, it, it really needs to be, he's clearly running or scurrying away with this candy. So it needs to have a ground plane, it needs to have that tangibility um, uh, and believability just so that, just so that you can, if nothing else, avoid the disconnect of like, why is this guy floating? You know, that's that's the disconnect that that can hurt um, the viewing potential. Um, and then on the right, this is an example again um, of, of it, it's the same kind of thing. It's just a solid, well, it's a gradiented background. So it's the same purpose as these. However, we can tell that she's standing on the ground. She's got contact shadows, a little bit of shadow from the lights and that disconnect is gone and it just feels better. It's, just, it, it's not even that hard, but um, not even that much harder than these but it does feel a lot better. So that was another note that I gave a lot. And finally, a half hour in, done talking about week three stuff. On to week four, um, architectural visualization. I know that I saw some questions pop in. Let me look at those real quick. Question, uh, a bit of a vague question, but can you possibly recall how long it took you to get lighting and be confident with it? Uh, well, if, Aaron, if you, if you didn't, if you weren't, I think you were here last week, but I kind of told my story of, of like my journey in lighting, specifically character lighting, but that also, it can apply it to the larger um, um, scope of lighting in general. But I would say that lighting was always a mystery and the best I could do was emulate slightly what I was told and what I was seeing, what I had seen um, for the first, I mean, if you count when I first got into it, it was, um, it was at least the first five years of like, of getting better and better at modeling, especially, but lighting was always neglected and I, I made baby steps in the lighting department. Um, so it was at least five years before I started making strides. So, and that was really, um, that was basically from when I first got into computer graphics to when I got my first job was when I started learning a storm of new info about uh, lighting and proper lighting. So about five years, I would say, um, was, was my situation. Uh, from Jake, I have trouble using depth of field to blur distant objects without making my, uh, my subject look like a miniature model. How do you avoid that visual effect while using depth of field? Um, so that is definitely, that's a work in progress. That's work in progress knowledge that I have right now. I am definitely aware that too much depth of field makes the object look miniature. Let's go back to this one, for example. I think the goblin does read in this situation like a miniature model, which when it comes to presenting a model, like a 3D model, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I don't think the, the miniature size matters that much. You know, um, I would prefer that for aesthetic reasons over trying to convey that the model is as tall as a building or something or a Statue of Liberty. Like that just doesn't do anything for me. I, the depth of field, I would rather it look miniature than not. Um, but that being said, my, my wife is getting into uh, photography and she has a nice camera now and I get to play with it and I'm learning a lot about depth of field, which is helping me to understand um, when a lot of depth of field conveys 
small size and when it just conveys, I'm trying to think of the other thing, like when it doesn't go against that basically. So I'm realizing that you can take photos with a ton of depth of field on a, on a regular person, but it doesn't look like that person is miniature. So it is very possible for depth of field to make something look miniature, but it's, it's also not the only outcome. That's kind of all I can say. I'm still learning about photography because that is a very complementary skill set to rendering. So I am learning about that stuff. Um, in time, I hope to give you a black and white answer, but not quite now. Um, <laughs> Aaron, you're like, we, I got a long way to go. Glad to hear it though. Uh, I mean, honestly, like part of my job, I would love to be able to demystify some of this stuff for you. So maybe you can fast track and learn this stuff sooner than, than me. I can already say from what I've seen, Aaron, from you, you're doing higher quality work than I did in my first year. Um, without a doubt, maybe even first couple years. Um, so you are learning faster than me. I think at this point in time, the information is more readily available. Hopefully I'm doing my job decently well and, and you're able to learn this stuff faster um, than, than what I had. All right, we talked about all this. Yeah, architectural visualization, finally getting to the meat of it, um, of the presentation, which is a lecture. Um, I'm trying to think, how do I start this? I had an idea for how to start this. Uh, yeah, okay, that's right. Architectural visualization for me is one of the, is maybe the most fun thing that we're gonna do this week. I have the most fun with architectural visualization. Um, and I, I, I hope that you guys do too. Omar, you're on the other end where it, you've, you've said that uh, you find interior lighting to be difficult. But I, I find it the opposite, if I'm, if I'm honest with you. It's not like a, easy, a monkey, any monkey can do it or something like that. It's not that extreme. But I do find it much easier than the character lighting we did last week. Um, so let's, let's get into it. And yeah, it's interiors only. There, there is exterior architectural visualization, or arc viz is how I'm going to refer to it from now on. Um, but that's kind of a whole other animal. It's a there's a lot to get an external render to look real. It's in, involving the environment. So much easier to do interiors. Um, okay, so my stance, my belief is that arc viz and realism go hand in hand. Um, and that's gonna be my goal for you. I want to see photorealistic renders from all of you this week. I'm going to be judging based on that. I think there's very little room for stylistic arc viz because by nature architectural visualization is to create computer graphics based on architecture that look completely real like that's where the benefit lies so when it starts to when you start stylizing arc viz it becomes more of like like uh an, it becomes more of an art less of a science and also more like set design for like an animation or something or environment design, which is different from ArcViz. So ArcViz specifically is all about realism. Um, and at this point in time, and it's been this way for, for years now, 99.999% of photorealistic renders are very possible today. That's not what I meant to say. 99.999% of photorealism is achievable today. All right, especially for ArcViz, um, being able to create interiors People have been doing that for a while. Render engines are very capable of it. And so the tools are there. It's just, uh, it's up to us to tap into it. And photorealism um, is, a, is a lot of fun. That, that's a big part of what I do. Um, I've not been trying to push realism very much. Um, I've been using different words, uh, which, um, yeah, I've been using different words. I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, that has to do with pop quiz. But I've been using different words rather than realism. I've been trying to train myself not to say realism up until this week because um, um, realism is very important here, but I don't want it to be the overarching thing in general with computer graphics. Um, and uh, there's a lot more outside of realism, but it is a lot of fun to achieve. It's like when you're able to achieve a render that, that is vis visibly convincing, um, to a photograph, that's just, that's good. It means that you have understood reality well enough to transpose that into uh, the digital realm. And that's a good feeling. So that's really fun. Um, it's much easier to render ArcViz than build it and set it up physically. And this is where ArcViz has a very strong foothold in in the industry, especially in like uh, 
like uh, furniture catalogs. Also, this is an art biz, but like a lot of vehicle renders are, or a lot of vehicle imagery and commercials is completely computer graphics. Um, but with ArcViz specifically, much easier to build this in the computer than to find an apartment or build a set or, or transport, you know, your actual furniture to take f photographs of it, pay for a photographer, much easier to just build all that with ArcViz uh, in the ArcViz genre than, um, than to, to do it physically. Uh, a fun fact is that the Ikea catalog is almost entirely computer generated, um, which is crazy. I remember reading the article when they kind of revealed that and the fact that, wait a minute, this, these images I'm looking at are, are generated in the computer. They're not, you know, physically, um, photographed and that, so that's pretty cool. It's, um, it's definitely neat that technology has advanced that, that far. Um, Mo okay, so also with ArcViz, it's mostly stills instead of animation because we're going to experience long render times. All right, that kind of comes with the territory. Um, expect long render times, especially if you want it to be clean and free of noise, they're going to be long. And so therefore that makes animation particularly difficult. Um, um, so most mostly this format is in still frames. Uh, ArcViz is a very, a very achievable genre. That's the important takeaway I want, I want to paint that picture before we get into it. Um, it's very achievable. Um, I'm trying to think if I want to explain that more. Well, for take example, uh, Jonathan, Mer Jonathan Mercado. Uh, this is a CG cookie user, and this is a very believable, I think in that realm of 99.9% uh, realistic. Um, and it's a, it's a modern type of interior. And because it's modern, you see a lot of modern interiors and they have very simple shapes. That kind of comes with the, the aesthetic of modern uh, architecture. And because of that, it means very simple models to create. Um, and so you get a big bang for your buck by doing simple models. Um, and I think lighting ArcViz is, is fairly, is more on the simple side too. And then you get a photorealistic render for a lot less effort than compare than than say a character render. A photorealistic character render is, I think, exponentially more difficult to achieve than than an ArcViz render like this. Even though they both, at the end of the day, have the goal of being photorealistic. Um, so that's why it's an achievable genre, and that makes it very fun. And you see a lot of people do this because uh, because it is achievable. So that should that should get you excited and and. Um, interested in this week because I expect to see some very good renders coming out. I think I missed a couple questions potentially. Um, <laughs> Aaron, open blender, use filmic, question mark, profit. <laughs> yeah, that makes me think that like the stigma that, that filmic creates photorealistic renders or something, but uh, I, it definitely does not in my opinion. Uh, any other questions that I'm missing? That wasn't really a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So ArcViz and realism. Let's go on to, okay. Yeah. Some more cool imagery. These are ArcViz examples from the CG cookie gallery. We've got Mikhail Ziesman. Um, uh, I believe, yeah, I always want to double check that in my head. She is, is, uh, a regular in the stream and she does very good Arc, ArcViz renders. So, uh, good job, Mikhail. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful, uh, very cozy type of scene. I, I personally, you know, in my in my my home decor preference, I don't love the modern style. Um, I prefer this kind of thing where it just feels a little bit more cozy and comfort comfortable. Um, but that's just a side preference. Uh, Martin Edland, uh, a beautiful chair, completely, in my opinion, photorealistic. Maybe a, a, you know the rug could l use a tiny bit of of um, attention, but it still, it still reads very, very well. Um, really, really nice work from Martin. Check out his gallery if you haven't seen it. Um, it's a, uh, yeah, it's in the staff. He, this, one of these images is in the staff pics. I think this one right here on the right, but, uh, another, a couple another, um, pretty images to get us excited. Kles Geisen, um, a, a modern like warehouse type of, uh, apartment type, uh, type style, which there's actually a lot of detail in this. And it reads really, really well, completely like a photograph, in my opinion. Um, you would have to nitpick it really hard to, to not feel like a photograph. And then Martin, another one from him, um, really, really solid work. This one's in the staff gallery, but check out work from him. Um, yeah, beautiful uh, Blender interior ArcViz renders. Really cool stuff. That's what we're going for uh, this week. And especially with an emphasis on 
uh, lighting. Well, do I want to say that? In the demo today, I'm not going to get deep into, like, I'm not going to do a brick texture or anything like that. So, um, well, now I'm talking out loud. The demo will not feature that stuff, but I would like to see this quality um, of, you know, brick textures and wood textures being used because they're really not that difficult to achieve. So um, I think we, and I think it's talked about in the course that I provide for, uh, as a support for this week. Anyway, um, question, we have to do a realistic interior for the homework. Ikea level realistic. I, that's the challenge, Omar. I want photo realism. I want to, I want it to be really tricky. I have to, where I, where I have to nitpick what doesn't look realistic about your renders. That's what I want. And it honestly, it shouldn't be that difficult. It really should not be that difficult. Um, especially if you use the scene that I'm going to provide, which is the, uh, the bathroom scene. It's what I'm going to demo. Now, if you wanted, you know, if you wanted to do a big, huge warehouse scene like this, that's, that's going to be a lot, uh, a lot more work, but, um, um, you go for a simpler scene, like, like, uh, I think another, uh, this example right here from Jonathan Mercado, that's a simple scene that can totally be done in a week. Um, so yeah, I want to see photorealism. Question, are all arc viz bright? Um, is there a point in doing an evening scene maybe? And, and hello, by the way, <laughs> hi, Dragon Eyes. Um, you know, that's a good question. There are definitely night scenes. So that's not, you can do a night scene, definitely. I think sometimes those can be trickier to get to be realistic. Um, a little bit trickier, but, but totally go for it. You know, like night or day, sunset, sunrise, what either any time of day is fine. Make me believe it. Make me believe it. Um, question, oh, I already answered that question. Is it preferable to use EV or cycles? I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Omar statement, that white, clean, realistic light has always eluded me doing realistic renders. I always get hash back, hash, or I always get harsh black shadows and have to give go 10,000 samples for a clean image. Man, something, yeah, that's just, once we get to the demo, yeah, I mean, because I'm gonna, I, when I rehearsed it, like, it's very easy to get the right amount of light into the scene. So, I don't know, Omar, be, be watching that and, and maybe we can dial in what, what's going on because you should not have to use 10,000 samples uh, for an image. That should not be the case, especially not with denoising. All right, so here's some, uh, uh, these are my renders and there's a practical side that's really cool about ArcViz. Uh, beyond just pretty imagery, my ArcViz, the, the top two or the, the, the one on the left and then the top one, came from practical reasons. So my wife and I wanted to, um, well, especially me, wanted to uh, add a bathroom to our our, uh, our house. And, you know, she's maybe less of a visual person. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, I took that opportunity to create, to scale, perfectly measured that bathroom in the computer, and then create a photorealistic render to convince her that, hey, let's let's make this, it would be a big benefit. And it, and it worked like she, she liked what she saw. And that was kind of the deciding factor that pushed us over the edge to actually do it. Um, and so that's a really, you know, if you outside of the computer world, like ArcViz has more practical, um, potential, I would say than like a, than character art specifically or vehicle art. Um, like you can actually do stuff and you, and when I created this render and also the kitchen render, like it taught me things about how big the island should be or how much space between the wall and the island, how many lights to put in the ceiling. Like that is another benefit of, of uh, ArcViz. Um, and so yeah, above that, we wanted to renovate the kitchen and I created this to showcase what it could look like. Um, so very practical reasons for my ArcViz, um, my ArcViz projects. But then on the bottom, you know, this kind of blends between ArcViz and visual effects. Uh, because that was a, a project I had at um, at a studio where these characters are the only f part of the footage that we had. Like everything was on green screen except for the characters, and um, and the back wall is a, a a projected photograph. So that you know, there's a caveat there. The back wall is is a photograph. It should look real. But then this uh, this right side grill, everything on the grill, the the front table, all of that is is, um, you know, I used ArcViz techniques and I learned a lot about ArcViz by doing this scene. And yeah, I'm 
I'm fairly proud of it. Like it's an animated shot with the camera kind of slowly orbiting around and it looks, it looked pretty realistic. So um, that's kind of my experience, more practical side of ArcViz, though I do want, aspire to, to like, I don't know, take a month or something and do like a, like nothing but ArcViz for, for the sake of like making pretty images. I think that would be cool. Um, Uh, awesome, Pavel, I'm gonna model my kitchen for this class and remove this ugly USSR uh, heating radiator. That's awesome, yeah, I would love for, to see you go all out. I mean, show me some rooms in your houses if you want. Like, um, have fun with this month. It, it's, a, it's a blast, trust me, it's a blast to recreate um, and reimagine parts of your home. Like, I get a big kick out of renovation in general and um, Blender has been a, a very cool utility for that. General question for the class. Does anyone have an animation to light? It would be nice to deliver, uh, to delve off and try to animate a, a movable scene. That's an excellent question. So uh, we actually just finished an animation. Me and, and Wayne Dixon did an animation for the Halloween season. And I am definitely, that's going to be the next course that I record uh, in, in November, is going to be taking his animation and how to light and shade it for a final uh, rendered animation. He's been asking me to do that for months. And so I'm finally gonna do it and that should fit exactly into what you're looking for. So uh, I'm really gonna try and get that out before Christmas, that's the goal. Uh, I'm new to Blender, I know the basics. Do you think I should still watch this or go watch something a little more basic? Um, well, I mean, for, I'm, we're only gonna be on for another like hour and 10 minutes. So I mean, maybe stick around with us if you want. Um, and. I mean, kind of hang out with us, see what this is all about. You might pick up tips and tricks, but then definitely if you're pretty new to Blender, you might want to, uh, you know, watch some some lower level. This is like intermediate to advanced level stuff. Um, but I mean, no reason to, to run off, hang out with us. We're, we're, we're cool people. Quest. All right, cool. Um, next. Uh, whoops, it's not what I meant to... That, oh, whoops. All right, so these aren't ArcViz characteristics. Did I mess that up? Oh, I did. Oh man, what is this guy's name? Um, let me find him. I messed up the title and I wanna find who that artist is. So now I'm gonna go through a couple, a few, three artists that I've, I've really enjoyed um, analyzing and studying their work. Because if you get into ArcViz and also throughout this week, um, if, you, if you wanna push yourself and get you know, artistic direction for how to create effective art viz, arc viz, you're gonna need to learn how to um, study what other artists have done. Um, art station, now where do I find, Anna, I need to find this guy, I messed up his name. Um, one second, one second. Done my likes. This guy, um, Constantinos Aninos. I'm just gonna edit that really quick. Um, sorry, do some live editing of my, my slideshow real quick. Not art based characteristics, notable artists. This guy. All right, back to the presentation. All right, so Constantinos Aninos, obviously you can find him on ArtStation. He does some of the best ArcViz work I've ever seen. Um, I mean, photorealism, yeah, that's like the given. It looks super real, uh, but the detail that he achieves is is next to none, frankly. Um, I mean, there are other artists of his caliber, but he, he does incredible work, um, totally realistic, very detailed, and you can see that in these renders. Um, and that, that, that's what I, I respect that because he's not going for only like modern. He, you know, like it's maybe a, it makes sense to start out with like simplistic modern style, but he also goes into more detailed styles with, you know, um, this is probably one of the simpler scenes up, up in the top left corner, but he also has this super messy bed with all kinds of wrinkly fabric. Um, extra, well, not that this isn't, I don't know, I'm not an expert at, at, at home decor styles, but to me, this doesn't this isn't the modern, the simplistic modern that I'm talking about, but maybe it is a modern style now that I'm talking out loud. But um, 
t so much detail everywhere in the renders, and that is going above and beyond and really making this tangible, believable, super realistic. Um, he also does different angles. Like there's kind of the obligatory um, full room shot, you know, like you it makes sense. You model the whole room. Of course, you want to render the whole thing as and, and get everything in one image as you can. So he does that stuff, sure, but he also does more interesting angles. Um, angles that don't show the whole room, but but feel like you're in that room or, or it's got like a photography aesthetic, you know, like putting the camera up high above the light fixture, looking down on the bed. Um, yeah, it just provides a, a unique perspective that I sometimes is lacking when it comes to ArcViz. Like people don't know how to render your, your room other than just to do the full shot. But um, doing a lot of tall uh, tall format renders, you know, like focusing on the couch with, uh, with the, the, the objects on the coffee table, like um, blurred out, like that looks really cool. It looks like a, a magazine photo kind of thing. Uh, he also does amazing, amazing exterior, your exterior lighting that, I mean, looks like a photo. It looks like it, it's brilliant work. So much detail. I mean, imagine creating this forest. And, um, but he's also got this, like, I kind of do this thing sometimes where I, uh, if <laughs> the way I describe it, if you cross your eyes and close one eye, all right? So cross my eyes and close one eye. Like, it blurs your vision, basically. That's what I'm doing. And when I do that, looking at that image, you know, it's got this artistic uh, color scheme going on where it's it's mostly green and blue around the exterior, but right in the center, it's got this glowing orange um, log cabin. And that's like an art artistic aesthetic uh, for him being an ArcViz artist that I think s makes him stand apart. A lot of times you get ArcViz being very stale and like sterile, um, and it doesn't look particularly artistic, where he is able to bridge that gap, in my opinion. Um, and then obviously, this I love this render. Um, it's astounding that it's not a, photo a photograph, but um, love the detail in the brick wall and this kind of rustic, uh, uh, kind of, br there's a lot of breweries, I feel like, that and, and restaurants nowadays that are getting this kind of vibe. But um, yeah, it's just so much attention to detail, you can just pour over these images. Uh, it's, it's really incredible. So yeah, uh, Constantinos and Enos, he's probably my favorite. Um, reference his stuff, learn from him. Um, another notable artist, ArcViz artist is George uh, Termonizzi. I think is how you pronounce that. He's a blender artist that I found on, on ArtStation. And he does inc a very similar um, high-end, highly detailed work that's not just limited to simplistic modern. Um, but yeah, I mean, same kind of thing. He uses interesting angles to showcase more of the room and get more bang for your buck uh, when it comes to ArcViz. And also even does like this cool, super realistic um, room, but it's rendered in an isometric style. So that's, I mean, you know, thinking outside of the box, which is kind of ironic since that is a box. But um, yeah, cool stuff from George Terminizzi. Check him out. It's another one to learn from. And then Suomi. I kind of had to give this shout out because... I don't think Suomi does much anymore. I, don't, I can't find much from, from that artist. But uh, when I was getting into Blender, um, Cycles was not around yet. And so you had Yaffa Ray and Lux Render to do realistic uh, interior arc viz. And Suomi like, stood out to me from those early days. And I mean, these are, renders are from like 2007, I think, 2008, that time period. And he's using this... Uh, I mean, I used Yaffa Ray and it was, it was painfully slow, made me think of Mental Ray, but he was, or she, he or she was just crushing renders um, back in the day. I always remembered them. They inspired me. So Suomi, um, good stuff out there too. So yeah, uh, those are three artists I recommend. Um, if you get into ArcViz, study them, figure out what they're doing and um, emulate it, you know, like learn through emulation and, uh, and start to create your own style out of that. All right, some questions I think I've been neglecting. Uh, awesome, welcome, Isaiah. Isaiah, we're happy to have you here. Um, welcome. Yeah, we have a lot of fun in the streams, um, for sure. So stick around, please. Uh, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> oh, Omar, um, can we get assets from the internet to populate our interior scene for the homework? Totally. Take advantage of blend swap. Take advantage of of um, Sketchfab. I mean, also when it comes to like like uh, furniture and stuff, Sketch Up. I think is that the. I think that's the Google thing. 
Is that what it is, SketchUp? Yeah, like there's a SketchUp library with a ton of models, like architectural models that, that you can use to build out your scenes. So yeah, definitely take advantage of all of that. I'm gonna provide the, well, what did I provide? Hold on a second. I provided either one or two model scenes. I can, if I haven't provided the other, I can do that. Um, if we go to the top, I provided, download the bathroom scene. I can, if anyone wants the kitchen scene, you can like, you can use that, I'll, I'll provide it. Um, it does render slower. So there's a lot more going on and potential for much slower renders compared to the bathroom scene, but you're welcome to it if you want it. Um, yeah, if anyone wants it, maybe remind me in this thread to post that. I'm sorry, I just, assuming I forget stuff, um, <laughs> wish my memory was better, but we got a lot of people participating too. This is a pretty busy class and and that's awesome. But anyway, um, where are we? All right, Suomi, we've gone over the artists. Uh, beyond those three, like branch out and find your own, you know, like take it upon yourself to find what inspires you and what um, what can push you in terms of artists that are already out there. ArcViz characteristics. We're going to wrap this up really soon um, and, and get into, into Blender. Um, but the things to keep in mind, HDR environments, that's a must. Um, it's just a no-brainer for realism to use HDR environments in this context. And really, we're going to only do an HDR environment, sort of like the car. But um, uh, the challenge with the car was just that using EV pretty much, whereas the challenge here is, is different. We're not using EV. Um, global illumination, that's another must. So if anything, you're going to want to increase your global illumination bounces um, um, rather than decrease them. So global illumination, super important here. That's again, why we want to use cycles, why I recommend using cycles. Uh, common sense lamp placement. That's what's nice about interior ArcViz is that it, it, it's just easier to make sense out of where to place your lights. It's not like character lighting, which is should it be above or should it be below? Both convey different things. Should I have a rim light on this side or on this side? Both. You know, there's way more choices to figure out in, in character rendering or in, I think, even like vehicle rendering, like um, really intentional vehicle rendering. But in ArcVis for realism, it just it makes more sense. Um, if you have a lamp in your scene, a physical object, put a, bolt, put a lamp object there. If you have a lamp model, put a lamp in the model, you know, that's pretty simple. If you've got can lights in the ceiling, put a lamp up there. If you've got a sun, if it's daytime, either use an environment only or put a sun lamp in the sky, pretty simple. Um, portal lights, that is something we're gonna talk about, um, but it's it's pretty key to in, um, interior arc viz, though uh, it, it, all it does is, um, I'll forget it, I will get to there. Um, I'll explain it once we get there, but it's just an important part of arc viz. Uh, Denoising, that's going to be huge. It's only been around for a few versions of Blender, maybe like one or two versions of Blender. But um, the denoising is going to be great. It's going to enable us to use fewer samples and get a render faster, which when you get into ArcViz, you have to be very patient, which is the next point. Patience is key um, because these can take a long time to, to clean up and be nice. Question, where do you download your HDR environments? Um, so there's several free sources. I recommend... Number one, HDRI Haven. All right, it is, this is a, a, a well-known Blender artist who has created this website. Um, uh, Greg Zoll, I believe. Yeah, Greg Zoll. And um, he, these are CC0. Like there is, these, this is public domain HDRI imagery. So check these out. I mean, they're super high quality and they're free. He's supported by Patreon. So I highly recommend that if you use this, you consider uh, consider supporting him. Um, but yeah, that's a great place to get free HDRIs. And I'm gonna be using one of his um, today. All right, patience, we've gone over the characteristics and can EV do ArcViz? That was asked earlier. Um, I'm gonna say it, you're welcome to try this week. Um, I know that that's, that's exciting having EV part of 2.8 and, and there's a lot of hype around it. Um, However, I think you're going to have a much harder time. I know you're going to have a much harder time getting getting photorealistic renders with Eevee compared to Cycles. Here we've got Pavel. He he is arguably the class expert when it comes to um, Eevee. He's just been like really pushing that forward and helping a lot of people out, learning things that I didn't know, um, sharing things that I didn't know. But on the left, he's been doing comparison renders. Cycles on the left, 
uh, Eevee on the right. One of the best interior ArcViz renders I've seen from Eevee. So I was impressed with this, but I could still nitpick it fairly easily um, oh, so to point out like what's not realistic about it um, fairly easily. It's not like I have like, you know, amazing vision for, for photorealism, but there's enough happening here that's not photorealistic compared to cycles. So basically cycles is gonna mean longer render times, but easier to achieve photorealism out of the box. Eevee is gonna be quicker render times, but much more difficult to get a photorealistic result. Much more difficult if possible at all. If someone wants that challenge, I, I would love to see you try and uh, prove me wrong that I, I can't determine a non-physically, a, a non-photorealistic Prove me wrong that I cannot tell it's not a Cycles render. Um, so yeah, it's up to you. I recommend Cycles personally, but you're welcome to try Eevee if you want. I accept the Eevee challenge. Miranda, proud of you. You do it. You do it. And I assume Pavel will too. Uh, anything else? Okay, wrapping up. Week four agenda. Um, okay, yeah, obviously we're practicing photorealistic rendering in the ArcViz context. I want it to be photoreal. That's I'm going to judge it highly based on that criteria. Uh, pre-recorded courses to watch, interior architectural visualization. That's really the only course that we have currently. Um, not that we won't revisit this, but let me see if I can find um, ArcViz. No, that's not gonna find it. Um, let's try this another way. Go to courses. I know that it's by Jay, author Jonathan Williamson. Sorry, we call him Jay. And there it is, architectural visualization. There's a link in the syllabus um, at the main homework thread, at the main class thread. Uh, but yeah, he goes over building and rendering, um, texturing material, adding materials and rendering this ArcViz scene. So I recommend you use that as your foundation throughout the, the um, throughout the week. And uh, even though it is pretty old, like it's it's still pretty relevant information. He's get, he gets a good result. And you can find some good tips uh, to lean on um, throughout that. Homework assignment. I want to see at least, well, one, I want to see at least one um, photorealistic shaded and lit ArcViz scene. All right. That's your main homework. That's part one of the homework. Part two, I want to see another light match. This is the last one. So um, three nice round odd number. Um, but yeah, do one more light match. You guys should be aware of, of what that's about. It can be, it can be a product render. It can be another character. Um, I guess it could be an arc this scene if you wanted. Um, even though I feel like that's a little bit more effort, but, um, yeah, so that's your homework. That's what we're doing this week. Pop quiz. Here we go. Which two words do I repeatedly use to describe high quality lighting? This is personal to me. I, I, I make a big effort to say these two words more than others. And it, and if you get, you can get 10 points per word if you know. If you've been following the class, if you've been, if you've watched much of my shading and lighting content, I use two words a ton this, this, this uh, month. I've used these two words. So if you can guess them, type them in the chat. Oh, Curious doesn't like, uh, or I'm curious, actually, Curious, do you not like light matches? I thought everybody was having so much fun with them. Crisp, that's a good guess, Tebow. I use that a lot with uh, the uh, vehicle course, but did not, haven't really been using that as much. Um, oh, I hope this isn't a bad question. I feel like I've been saying it constantly. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Inst oh no, whoops. Um, we're getting somewhere with realism. It's not realism, but I, I use these words in place of realism. Contrast, these are, ah, I thought this would be a no-brainer. I thought you'd be sick of me saying these words by now. Warm and cold, I do say that a lot. All right, I'll give it one more minute. Oh, curious, I'm sorry. Um, I'm curious why you don't like them. Strong rim light. Uh, I must not have made it a good, or hopefully when I say this, you'll be like, yeah, oh, totally. Photorealism. No, that's not the word. All right. Sorry, that was maybe a bad question. Maybe too obscure. Accurate, saturated gradient. All right. So the words believable and tangible. 
All right, I think th those are much better words to describe high quality lighting than photoreal, realistic, um, particularly because there's a difference in my opinion. Oh yeah, you got one, Dragonite's believable. All right, Dragonite, you're gonna get 10 points, woohoo. Um, but yeah, I've been trying to use these words a lot. I feel like you even, you should have heard me say like, I start with realism, then I say, wait, no, believable and tangible, because those are different things in my opinion, in my understanding. It's a word that I use to describe the place between like artistic liberty and uh, photorealism, right? Like it needs to be tangible. And that, that when I talk about like contact shadows, the character not floating in the sky um, when it looks like he's running, like that is a tangible, believable quality. Uh, even though, you know, it's maybe less photoreal to have like an orange colored back wall as your background. It's, it's you know, that so photorealism is out the window, but like believable and tangible is still there. And that's what I like seeing. Um, never would have guessed that. Huh, maybe I have not been saying that as much. I've been very intentional to say those two words, but at least Dragon Ice knew what I was talking about. So uh, anyway, I'm going to give you two, uh, 10 points. All right, let's get into Blender. Um, if anybody's still watching at this point on YouTube, once I post it, uh, congrats for making it this far. We're actually going to get into Blender and push some buttons. <laughs> cool. All right, over to Blender, which, by the way, I am using 2.79. I've used 2.8 for the other tutorial, other uh, live streams, but I'm just jumping into 2.79 just because. Um, maybe maybe a comfort that it's, it's it's a little more stable and maybe maybe I won't have uh, potential problems. So we are going to jump back to the 3D view because I've got my scene open. This is the scene that I've provided so far. It's a, uh, actually might've provided the 2.8 version. Hmm, that's something I didn't think about. Um, anyway, this is the bathroom scene that you've already seen me render, and I'm going to start from scratch. And the goal with this demonstration for the next 50 minutes is to uh, just achieve like a realistic lighting first, something that's very believable, um, tangible. There's his words. Uh, well, actually, I'm really trying to go for photorealism. So beyond those words, I want it to be photoreal. Uh, and, and I'm going to show you, in, in my experience, how it's particularly easy, it's accessible to end up there, as long as you're using the right tools. Um, and then from, from once we do that, uh, I do want to show you IES lights, which is a, kind of a fun way to um, mimic. Well, let's just, while, I'm, while we're talking about it, I, if we look up IES lights, so what we're talking about is this kind of thing. Um, let me look right here. So some lights have a, a certain pattern that emanates from the light and you see it on the wall. Like if you ever go to an art gallery or something and and there's like a, a spotlight kind of on the wall, like you can see these sort of patterns and these are like called IES patterns. Um, I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert on them, but Basically, I, I call or I think of IES as just patterned lights, whereas, you know, your regular spotlight, which you'll see, is just kind of bland. Your regular light source is just this, this very even gradient. Um, adding this kind of IES pattern uh, makes it a little more interesting, a little more realistic. So I'm going to show you how to set those up. Um, not, uh, yeah, I'm going to set, set those up, uh, how to at least imitate them, and then... Yeah, we'll create, I think we'll create, have some time to create some basic materials as well, like wall paint, um, maybe some metallic bits, uh, the countertop, stuff like that. Sim uh, materials are generally simple in this context. You know, we're not going to have crazy materials or anything. Uh, in my actual bathroom, like we've got a, a marble um, floor tile. So like it's pretty, it's pretty light on the, on the actual texture side, which I like. Uh, so the, the materials are going to be simple. But yeah, that's what we're going to do for the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Um, yeah, 2.8 alpha two master race. Uh, cool. Um, I'm with Jake weak. All the cool kids are using 2.8. It's funny when I do 2.8, I feel like I get requests to do 2.79. So I figured I would throw them a bone and do 2.79 this time. But now I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting the backhand for it. Um, but anyway, nothing that I'm going to show you here is going to, is like, specific to 2.79 or 2.8, it, it, um, they're both applicable. 
Um, all right, so I've got this, uh, also the way I set up my, my uh, workspace, this is pretty typical for me. Um, I've got a my render camera. I've got that uh, set up in the bottom right corner so that you know I can optimize a little bit my uh, my whoops, my render viewport. Um, so it's just not using as many resources as uh, especially since I'm streaming. So that's what I recommend. Set it up this way, and then your main viewport you can use as the sh uh, shader, the node editor once we get there. Um, but uh, starting off, so I'm just gonna hit Shift Z in the viewport, see what we get in the bottom right, which it should be I'm pretty sure like nothing. Yeah, nothing. It's just black. There's no lights in the scene. There's no environment. Um, so I'm gonna start right away with an environment. Okay, so we're gonna go to the World tab. <laughs> Question: Are we allowed to download textures, or should we stay true to the class and use materials? using Blender only. No, no, uh, I'm not expecting you to, to do all procedural materials. Um, you're absolutely welcome. Use Texture Haven. Um, just type in Texture Haven and it's gonna be your first result, Texture Haven. It's by Greg Zoll as well. Um, I don't actually, I think there's less textures on Texture Haven. Like it's not as, as fully featured um, yet. It's like he's still building up the library. But there are some really good examples, you know, brick wall and cobblestone, you know, um, in case you have a cobblestone room in the interior, but it looks like that's plaster. So yeah, you're welcome to download textures uh, for this week. Uh, no problem with that at all. All right, okay, so we've got our, our scene starting to render and I was, I was opening a environment HDR texture. So going to the world tab, we um, are also using Blender Render throwback. So I'm gonna jump over to cycles, click use nodes. Oh, and we are getting lights. Um, I forgot that there are lights in here for some reason. Strange. All right, let's get rid of, Here, here's what I can do. Uh, hit the space bar, select by type, all my lamps in the scene. Let's delete them. All right, now we're back down to um, no lights, but since our our uh, environment texture is using a color that's not black, we get a tiny bit of illumination. Let's switch this to an environment texture. Now we get pink, that means um, it's waiting for a texture, so we'll hit open. I'm gonna go to my HDRI, uh, my HDRI collection, CC source HDRI zero, HDRI haven. And let's use this guy, the symmetrical garden. All right, so right away, I'm getting some environment light, and uh, but it's not coming through the window. And that's because my window geometry has glass built into it. All right, so if I tab into edit mode, I actually have those bits selected. And I recommend you know, you have that option here because you can make these materials like a glass material, which I think is overkill because you're gonna make the the engine render like refraction when it doesn't need to. Um, instead, I'm just gonna move this glass off to the side and literally make it an open window because that's gonna work fine. Um, I'm just gonna move this off to the side and now we're gonna get oh, an open window. We can see our environment and light is gonna be coming in there. But we're also getting light from from this open door, okay? So I, I'm i fine with that. We'll just leave the door open and you know maybe this is a particularly bright room with a lot of windows and that's why so much light is coming in. There we go, we justified it, no big deal. Um, and, but if we, now I'm gonna orbit around my bottom viewport here and leave the scene, leave the room because now we can see our world environment. I want this this sun because right now, it's kind of dull, it's kind of boring. We want a, I want a strong key light from the sun to, to shine into this room and, and brighten everything up. It's just gonna be far more interesting that way. Um, so I need to rotate the environment. Let's switch to the node editor over here with my, um, well, I don't need anything selected, but I'm gonna to go to the world option for my shader and um, make sure that I've got node wrangler enabled. It is enabled, awesome. For the environment texture, I'm gonna select it and hit Control T, and that will create 
texture coordinates and a mapping node. And so now I can rotate the Z option. And if I hit 90 degrees on this particular map, we're starting to get the sun showing through the room. Let's, uh, I'm gonna hold shift and rotate that a little bit more. It's not gonna be quite real time, but it should give us feedback enough. All right, maybe not holding shift. So I'm trying to figure out where I want the sunlight to come in. It's pretty much, it's close to high noon, so we're, we're getting pretty sharp shadows and it's coming from high above. What about this? How's that look? I don't know, that might be a little bit too prominent on the front side of the... Maybe I'll just leave it at like, what, what does 100 look like? Yeah, maybe I'll just leave it like this. You can see the, the sunlight coming in from the bottom. Um, so it, like that light is gonna start bouncing thanks to global illumination all over the room. We get a much more interesting, much more well-lit room. Um, awesome. There's always a nice Easter egg to learn from Blender. Select by type. Definitely useful. Um, yeah, don't hesitate to ask questions along the way whenever you're, um, anything's not making sense. Omar, I want to figure out why it's difficult for you and why you're having to use so many samples. So currently I am... Uh, let's look at my samples since, since we're talking about that. Currently, it's uh, it's obviously very noisy, okay? I'm not expecting to see a clear image down here in the bottom. I'm also only using eight cores of my CPU. I'm not on GPU, so I'm not giving it the fastest calculation potential. But I've got my samples, I think, fairly low at 128, uh, only 32 in the viewport. I'll bump that up to 100 so it perpetually... Um, clears up, but it is very noisy and, and denoising is gonna do a lot of work for us. So let's get um, let's get some denoising renders going. Uh, I'm gonna enable denoising and also make sure that my render size is like pretty low, like 25%. Um, and let's do an actual render because I can start building up a progression from this point. funny I've still got that line from from uh, what is that like the 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 spectrometer that's not what it is but the the measurement tool for for values uh, should read the node wrangler docs I was pretty tired while adding this uh, coordinate and mapping by hand for past exercises yeah, the Node Wrangler does a lot of hel of helpful macros, and I, I only scrape the surface for what I know it can do. But yeah, it does a lot of, of helpful things. Um, I don't want to see that anymore. How do I? Where are my scopes? Where are my scopes? I want to get rid of that. Uh, does anyone know where those went? I'm so confused. I want to... My scopes are gone. What is going on? This is crazy. Is it because I have an object selected? Sorry, I'm really trying to get rid of that that line. Scopes. Okay, I was in edit mode. That was weird. Scopes. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, go back to the render. Let's look at it. Slot number one. All right, so denoising right out of the gate. Much cleaner, but there's not enough samples to avoid the splotchiness. You can see here how splotchy everything is. So that's, we need to give it a few more samples. Um, even though I've messed a lot with the the denoising settings, they're still a bit of a mystery to me. So if you're hoping to get all of those demystified, I'm afraid I don't have that for you. Um, I've messed around with these settings a lot and really the only thing I've seen do the best job is just cleaning, is adding more samples. 
So for the render, that only took 44 seconds. Maybe let's double it, 256. I want this to be fairly you know, quick too. I don't wanna to waste too much time rendering. Um, so we might have to deal with some splotchiness. Also, I don't like 64 performance. I like 32 tiles personally, 32 uh, X and Y tiles. I think it can it, it has the better potential to go slightly faster. It's called a histogram. There's a histogram, but also there's other scopes. Um, histogram, vector scope, anyway. Um, all right, so with more samples, with double the samples, we'll see how much less splotchy the render is. And maybe it won't even go that that long above 44 seconds, hopefully. Oh, I don't talk too much. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll post the recording soon so you can catch whatever you miss, but you have a good rest of your day. Search, searched said, searched said. Any questions I'm missing while I'm rendering? I know, hope you guys are okay with watching a render happen in real time. I know that's definitely like watching paint dry, grass grow, but uh, no getting around it for a live stream format. Man, that, that looks so much better. Just with 256 samples, Alt J. There is still some splotchiness, but I think, I think maybe a sample size of like a thousand should be enough. Um, maybe I'll do, I'll try and do a final, final render. Um, but anyway, um, so Omar, you should not have to deal with 10,000 samples. Denoising should be better than that. Cool. All right. So let's pick back up now that we've done a couple renders. You can see the difference um, that samples makes a pretty big difference in the splotchiness. And it's only a minute and 12. Ah, I want this to go a little bit faster. So I'm going to remember that. Um, I'm going to go back to 128 just for for fa uh, fast purposes, try and make this a little bit faster. So we've got, uh, let's go to slot three and think about what happens next in the render. So we've got, yeah, well, let's look at it again because I, we're not really even, I'm not even talking about it. Um, so, I mean, that to me is already reading much more realistically out of the box. Like that we didn't, we have not done a lot of work. We um, have a, a bright enough environment um, I mean, if we don't think the room is bright enough, which arguably maybe it's not because I think our materials, yeah, our materials are default. So it should look white, you know, like uh, the, the default material is kind of a 0.8 value. So it should be white. This to me says we need to increase the brightness of our world. Let's double it. That's going to increase the energy. And even though there is like one real window inside the, uh, the room, it's going to be a little dark, but it should be brighter than this. All right, let's do a render. Um, I think that's going to be a little bit better. Whoops, I went over slot two. Questions, why don't you G use GPU for rendering? I have a 2013 Mac Pro and the GPU is not very good in it. That is particularly why. Um, <laughs> Yeah, definitely a little bit meditative. Uh, that's a positive way to look at waiting for renders. But yeah, auto, right away, just increasing that, you have a much brighter scene, much more, I think, properly leveled scene. Question, does the amount of bounces also reduce graininess and stuff? Yeah, if you want... Um, so I don't know that the amount of bounces decreases... Oh, uh, well, yeah, I guess so. Um, light paths, if you change the bounces, I'm using the default, by the way, I have not changed this at all. Um, it, you know, it, you have this, these presets, direct light is no bounce of light. Um, limited global illumination is not even the default, I don't think. Yeah, that's, that's less than what the default is. Uh, the default is like, um, reset to default value, reset to default value. Yeah, so, it, um, Limited global illumination decreases that a little bit. Let's see if we see anything in the viewport. If we go from uh, full global illumination. Oh, it doesn't do anything. Let's restart the render. 
Obviously increasing the number of bounces is going to mean, uh, wow, yeah, that's a lot brighter. Yeah, that's significantly brighter. Um, and in reality, you don't really have a limit on bounces. So that's something to keep in mind for, for truly photorealistic, you know, higher bounces are going to be, be more realistic, but for practicality purposes, I find that limited global illumination, um, let's change to that. Notice, take a mental snapshot here. Very, very bright, especially in the corner right here. It's still very bright. Um, shift Z and restart it with, with limited global illumination. It's going to be significantly darker. So that is something to keep in mind. I, I like the default of 12, but um, well, for the sake of testing, let's do full global illumination and do a render. Let's see what the time difference is and what the quality difference is. Can, you can get an external GPU uh, solution connects through the Thunderbolt. Uh, yes, I think, well, I think I knew that. Anyway, thanks for the suggestion. Um, I think I'm gonna get a new computer. I've talked about it before, but um, I'm trying to get a new computer. Uh, fallen out of love with the Mac a little bit recently. So I'm gonna, I think, try and get uh, build a PC with some high-end GPUs. Uh, question, does it make sense to do lighting before you add texturing and shading? Uh, yes, I think it does. If Personally, I like to do both of them kind of simultaneously. I like to do them and make them work together. So I don't like to strictly isolate um, texturing, uh, texturing and shading away from lighting. But if I'm going to start with anything, I'm going to start with lighting first. And then once I get a decent level of light, I will um, start creating my materials and then leave the lighting open to manipulation later. Um, okay, so that took 50 seconds. It actually, why in the world did it take less time? No, 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 that's not right. Oh, I went to slot three. Okay, slot one was 44 seconds, limited global illumination. Slot two, brighter, but the same limited global illumination, and then went from 51 seconds what in the world? It took less time to render 128 bounces. How does that make sense? So maybe now I can go, I can trust that the HDR is leveled correctly and go back down to one. Interesting. Notice I have integrated graphics NVIDIA GPU in my notebook and in 2.8 I can render in both at the same time. That's awesome. So you've got your GPU and CPU tag teaming the render. I don't think I knew that that's, I thought it was one or the other. That's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, prospect, pr uh, prospect a plan, prospect a plan. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try, I've got about a half hour left. I'm gonna try and start creating some materials. One of them certainly being the uh, mirror uh, in front of the lavatory. Huh, so even, I think it actually does need to be brighter. I think I prefer the brightness. Well, I don't know. Now that I'm thinking about it, I am gonna add some lamps. So let me do that first before before increasing the brightness again. So that's level two of the environment and that's level one. I think level two is probably more realistic. Um, uh, I think level one is probably more realistic. Um, all right, so on to slot number five. Let us add a couple more lights into the scene because uh, I do want to add these little lamps. They're fun to add. These little sconces, I think, is what they're called. Shift A lamp. Let's go with a point light. And uh, well, actually, let me delete the point light. I'm going to place my cursor where I want the point light. Shift S, cursor to selected. Now add a point light. All right, that is super bright. Let's change that down to, ah, whoops, that's the world, not the lamp. Let's go down to one. That's just way too strong. All right, so for these lamps, I, you know, I, based on the first week's homework, you guys know that I like warm lighting when it comes to lamps. So I'm gonna push that into the warm direction. And let's just figure out like what kind of, what kind of uh, value we need for this, maybe two. 
Also something to maybe address is what is my color space? Am I using filmic? No. All right, let's do a comparison filmic versus non-filmic. Let me first add um, another light. Shift D X. I'm going to make that a linked object. Shift S, whoops, Shift S, selection to cursor. There we go. All right, let's do a render first with um, default color space, and then we'll change it to filmic. Wow, that's awesome. Pavel, that is very interesting to know. Wow, I don't think I knew that. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. I need to get my act together with uh, with hardware knowledge, hardware um, information in order to make this new computer be as good as possible for what I need. So thank you. Question with this render, would you break up the render into multiple layers and then composite it back like Jonathan did in the interior? Oh, I did. it's funny. I don't, I forgot that he did that. Um, no, I would not approach it that way personally. I would, um, as I have gone on in my, my computer graphics journey, I, uh, I do less and less compositing in that sense, breaking the scene apart. I just, I just find that that is a lot of, of extra effort that's not really needed, um, for most things. And in this case, I would much rather just wait for a slightly longer render then um, then then go through the effort of breaking it up and, and tweaking it uh, on a layer basis. So no, I don't rec I don't really do that. Um, but I mean, it's not an invalid approach by any means. Oh, wondering about it for a while. What does linked do? I hope this question isn't stupid. Not stupid at all. Um, I'm gonna switch first to slot six for this comparison, and then kick off the comparison, switching to film, ick. All right, render image. All right, go back to the 3D view. So what linked objects does is if I change the, the, the two spotlight, I'm sorry, the two point lights are linked. And if you change the color, um, it will change the color of both. Like it basically uses the same object data, which is right here, 0.02. You can see that 0.02 is the object data and then um, point is the object itself, right? So here we've got the object container and there's two separate objects, 0 0.001, 0 0.0, or just point, but they're both sharing 0 0.002. You can see that 0 0.002, you see the number two. That means there's sh it's two separate objects sharing the exact same data. And that has its uses, like right here, I want these light bulbs to be the, exactly the same. And if I change the color or brightness of either one, I want it to affect both of them. All right, how's that render doing? Oh, I think it's done. Whoop. All right, so this is filmic. This is not filmic, right? Wait a minute. Oh, so I didn't need to re-render, silly goose. Silly goose. Uh, you just need to change the color space, of course. So those look exactly the same. But if you change the color space to default, notice how blown out the lamp is. But when you change to filmic, the blowout goes away and it kind of gets this kind of general wash of the, uh, of the whole image. So if I change exposure... kind of interesting. I, I rarely play with these right here. I usually just leave it the default. But anyway, that's kind of, you can see what filmic versus default does. Now, I've used default for so long that I'm kind of used to it, but let's just go with filmic, whatever. We'll go with it. It's the latest and greatest. Um, so now my, my, my um, room is lit very, very well. Uh, almost too well. I feel like I kind of want there to be a little bit more contrast. So I'm going to maybe make an artistic decision. 
and decrease my light bounces, even though that does seem to be rendering faster. I want a clean render. I want to know how many samples I need to get a clean render. I'm, I'm kind of tired of the splotchiness. Um, change to base the contrast. Yeah, I'm realizing that maybe I can. But, but think about this. Like We can change the contrast here in the color management, or we can change it in compositing, or we can change it in the light values. So I don't know. I'm a little, for some reason, less comfortable changing it here and changing it in the color space. I'm a little I'm a little out of my comfort zone. I typically change that stuff in the light values and in compositing or in in post processing like changing my values. Um anyway, I'm getting a little bit off track. Uh Whoa, whoa, whoa. notice I need to change from none to base contrast. That's what you're talking about. Um, to base contrast, filmic, base contrast. I'm not seeing any difference. Oh, okay, maybe base contrast does look like the default. Very low contrast, medium to low contrast. Interesting, high contrast. Okay, so it does in very high contrast. I do like that. See, that's more that's more the levels that I want but I feel very weird about changing it in color management. I don't know, let's run with it. I've never ever done that before. I always change those values either in the in the, the light settings. Oh, but look at my light in the background. Look how dark my uh, trees are. This is, this is new territory, I'd never do this. That's so interesting. Um, wow, it seems like all of you guys use that way more than I do. Select, yeah, all of you guys are aware of this and I was not. Um, that's just, that's just, that's just uh, blowing my mind a little bit, being able to change it there. Fascinating. What does it do for default? Huh. I mean, that's kind of what I want right there. Uh, I don't know. What I'm learning from this is that just find something that looks nice, I guess, is what I'm kind of learning from it. Um, <laughs> I do want to move on and like kind of create some different materials at this point. Um, um, something that, okay, here's something that I find off-putting particularly, is when you can very clearly note uh, notice the outside color um, of, the, of the environment. I think that that's just a disconnect because there needs to be an exposure difference from inside to outside. Um, Especially in photographs, you know, if we go back to the presentation, for example, um, way up here. Okay, like take this for example, um, in Suomi's uh, render, it looks very photorealistic, but the the lights, the the windows are all completely white, um, and that's more of an exposure thing that happens when you when you photograph inside and there's a window. It's very rare that you make out much of the outdoors. Um, same here, you know, like outside, you can see a tiny little bit but generally it's blown out white. And that's just typical uh, in architectural visualization. Here you can see it more clearly than like anywhere else, but still it's very blown out. So I like to do that. Um, I kind of use this little trick. Uh, I'm gonna go to my node editor. First to slot six, go to my node editor, and I'm going to add an input light path. All right, and I'm going to duplicate this, shift control D. Nope, that's not what I want to duplicate. Shift control D, the background, add a shader mix node, mix shader. And I'm going to use the is camera ray as the factor. And this means that I can change the background to be super bright if I want. All right, so I bumped the strength up to 10, so now it's mostly white on the outside, but um, it's not affecting the lighting of the scene itself. So, you know, you can crank this up if you want. Wait, I was just at 10. 
and, and get it completely white and then maybe blur that out. But that to me is, you know, reflects more what you see in these situations. Um, it just takes a very advanced like exposure control to actually be able to see outside and inside. And so I think it's also part of, partly a distraction if you can see too much outside. But yeah, in all of these renders, note how, how bright the outside is. Um, all right, so I'm going to leave it as that. And then let's start adding some materials. Let's just, let's just dive into that. About 15 minutes. Um, and this is a fun part, in my opinion, because there's not a lot of complexity to these materials. Um, so we can start to build up uh, the library and, and all of our, our material uh, pieces pretty easily. So I'm gonna add a new material called mirror. And we're going to um, use the, I guess the, yeah, the principal BSDF, that's gonna be our typical option. And I'm gonna change the, I think, is it metallic all the way up, I believe? If metallic is all the way up and then the color is set to one, uh, we do get an issue though. So I'm I'm reflecting the environment and that trick I showed you is messing it up. So I need if uh, ah I didn't think about that. The trick might not be valid here. If I mute that, yeah. So now the mirror is reflecting much more realistically. Maybe we can't do the trick. Maybe I have to do that in compositing and just blow blow out both of them. Um, anyway, I'll leave it like this. Because that's uh, this right here is too big of a disconnect. Super bright white. Um, yeah, so I'll just mute that. Um, go back to the 3D view. We've got our mirror. Let's start building up. Uh, the most annoying part is going to be the selection process. Honestly. I'm just going to try and select objects for... Um, the material that I'm going to create, new material, let's call it wall paint, um, wall paint, how about wall satin gray green, um, Omar, are you still here? It's the light path node, yeah, okay, so like based on what you've seen, is it different from your experience for like how easy it is to get realistic lighting? To me, it's it's very simple in a couple steps, good HDRI, proper placement in the window, um, and you start to get really good renders, like very realistic renders using, you know, honestly the default cycles. Uh, so I'm just curious why yours aren't maybe turning out quite as good or why you find it difficult. But I'm wondering if any of this is clearing it up. Um, could light path node help reduce floor light um, uh, floor light messes when trying to light object? Uh, could that light path node help reduce floor light messes? I'm curious what you mean by floor light messes. If you can clarify that for me, I should be able to answer you. Question: If if there is time over uh, after the arc viz, could you show some something again? Uh, the week when you had shade the light in car added a texture and depending on the object size, it was having a different effect. How do you change that? Oh, I think you're talking about um, the texture space option. Yes, yes. Um, I'll do that as the very last thing. Once we're once we're kind of done with this arc viz, yeah, like you said, I'll, I'll, t I'll go over the texture space again. Um, nuts, did I deselect? Okay, we've got the wall green satin. I'm gonna change the color, use a, a principled BSDF. Well, yeah, principled BSDF. Where is it? Principled BSDF. So in a bathroom, typically when it comes to house decoration, whenever you have a place where water is going to be or a kitchen where it could potentially be dirty, you usually want to have a, not a satin, but a, a semi-gloss because uh, stains do not wipe off of satin very easily where they do with semi-gloss. <laughs> so... Uh, I'm gonna change that color and give it just a subtle amount. To expedite this, I'm gonna zoom in on just a small portion. Oh, I also need to 
copy materials to other objects. That's gonna, that's the real thing that I need. And this is gonna be where the process slows down because I do need to do renders to um, affirm my decisions. And uh, wow, is it really that glossy? I'm gonna change my saturation uh, down to like 0 0.5, 0 0.05. Okay, that looks better. Now, what is my roughness? Yikes, my roughness is set to zero. So it's like, like a mirror shine. Um, all right, I'm gonna set it to 0.5. All right, maybe do, um, let's see here. I'm gonna just kind of blow through and create a few materials like this um, to try and give us something more interesting to look at. So I'm gonna select for the for the trim, I'm gonna use a different paint, a, a more glossy paint. Uh, I'm gonna duplicate the existing wall semi-gloss, ca call it maybe gloss, uh, no semi-gloss white. Oh, that's hard to do. Semi-gloss white. All right, this one is going to be 0.8. Actually, maybe 0.9. All right, excellent. Now let me go through and select some objects that need that material. Right, this material, oh, this object needs it too. Shift. Oops. Just trying to select the uh, several objects that need the white paint material. Yeah, selection is the most annoying part of this. Um, let's add white. What in the world? What did I add that material to? Somehow that material was created but not used by anything. I should also, let's see if I can make this a little more discernible in the viewport. So. I think it's kind of weird, but we have to deal with it where, um, you know, the default base color, I need to copy and paste that to the viewport color. And that'll help us make a little bit more sense. All right, we should get a lot, a significantly more interesting render at this point. Maybe the last thing I'll do, I don't know what that is. Shift L linked. I think I'm missing some questions, comments, and link. Let's see here. I think the scene makes the difference. The one I was trying to light had a small window in the front, and it's a big living room. Let's see what you're talking about, Omar. I mean, like, this doesn't look bad at all. Um, I think... I mean, to me, this looks pretty realistic, Omar. The floor, the floor tile looks great. Like the way it's reflecting the the light works really well. Um, if you feel like it's not realistic, to me, it would be that there's no furniture, right? If you add furniture in there, it's gonna be it's gonna be much more realistic. Also, it's a, uh, you know, it's kind of a gen. It, um, I don't mean to say <laughs> it's a bit of a more generic like apartment type vibe. So it's not like cool architecture or nice furniture um, necessarily. You know, like if it had those things, I think your lighting is, is great. Um, I like I like your glow around the window. Um, to me, so if this was hard for you, I like, I don't know, I think this looks really good. It looks very believable. Um, so yeah, maybe the scene does make a difference, the type of room that it is, the type of furniture. Um, maybe that's kind of what's missing. 
I didn't get the nice soft light that the that um, the one that makes the room feel so real. And when I added furniture, the shadows were really intense and it looked awful. Interesting. I wish I had a version of the furniture of the furniture in there. But um, save Kent. Thank you, Wilco. Save as number number one. All right. Ah, the time just flies by. I feel like I've done nothing on this scene. I'm going to add a quick mat uh, material, a tile material. Um, and I'm just going to ballpark these values. Principal BSDF, specular at 0.5 should be okay. Well, maybe 0.2 and then specular roughness at like 0.01. That's closer to reality. I want to do a render and see where we're at. <laughs> the um the save squad thank you for coming out and saving me by uh, imploring me to save the file thank you um is there anything i want to go over i do want to go over portal lights i was testing portal lights i've used portal lights a few times um because they have this reputation of being like super important for ArcViz, but in my tests, it actually made the scene more grainy and took longer to render, which is pretty weird. Not what I expected at all. Yeah, ugh, this is, this is just so work in progress. I wanted to get further. I've only got like five minutes. Man, it's super splotchy. Did I not copy the material? I don't think I did. Um, all right, so that does not look very good. Um, let's see here. Let me add the, the white tile to this as well. couple bits and pieces that did not get the wall material. Oh no, I accidentally pressed. From 2.8, I pressed Alt-A and it started the animation. Oh, don't crash on me. Okay. All right, how about a uh, material for this guy? I'm just sort of re meandering around the scene trying to um, get some materials on the wall uh, or on everything. And with this material, it needs to be fabric, but it needs to be translucent. And this one's kind of weird. All right, so I'm using the translucent BSDF, but I'm gonna mix it together with a transparent, I think. Um, let's go to the material, input, uh, transparent, I'm sorry, shader, transparent. BSDF, Shift A, Shader Mix. All right, so like that, it's completely see through. But I don't want it to be black. Um, I'm having a brain fart on how to create this material. I've done it before. Um, how would I do this? Maybe uh, I'm so sorry. I'm t I need some help. I need to I need to phone the audience um, about creating this material. Gosh, I'm just forgetting. I've done this before. 
Um, translucent BSDF works fairly well. Maybe tr cranking it up all the way to white. Oh, maybe that's all it was. Yeah, I'm sorry. Gosh, that's brain fart. Um, so I, tr I transported, I, I pushed that all the way to white and not transparent, but I want a shader diffuse or a principled. And I'm gonna mix those two together. And just favor perhaps the uh, translucent one. Maybe not that much, something like that. All right, so now we've got a little bit more in the scene. Let's see what that looks like. All right, let's render. Oh yeah, I still wanna show you IES lights and I wanna show you um, portals. I, okay, cool, you guys helped me out. I would use the principal shader, use a procedural texture to control the transmission value. That's a fair approach to create the illusion of what, yeah, it does need a texture, that's for sure. Um, definitely. Does need a texture, a fabric texture on the, on the, um, on the curtain. Can't we achieve, achieve transparency with principled in the transmission value? Um, you can't, the, the uh, principled, I don't think has this transparent, not transparent, this translucent material option. So it's kind of a, yeah, it actually looks pretty good. Looks like a nice linen type material. Um, but I don't think principled inc incorporates that translucent. It's kind of like a pseudo faked uh, SSS material. And it works really nice for stuff like that. And that actually turned out quite good. Light path node cover your eyes. I think Omar's had some rough experiences with the light path node. Um, all right, that does not look great. It's very unfinished at this point. Um, but I think I need to use the last few minutes to, I wanna show you IES lights. And so um, I'm going to do that. And where I would use this, for example, six, let's go to seven is if I were to add a lamp, area lamp, in place of these, uh, these, these can lights right here, that's gonna be the place for an IES type light. So if we position that, I know I'm doing it the really hard way. We position that. Um, now we can, I wonder if I can just hide everything else. I kind of want to see just what this light would do. So if I turn my environment off, oh yeah, is it this one? Yeah. Let me turn this off and then I'm going to turn off my point lights. All right. We just have the area lamp. First thing I'm gonna do is dial down the value because it's way too high. All right, so here's a, a can light by itself. All right, it doesn't look too bad. It's just a, a steady stream of, of light and, and gradient all the way down. If we go to the node editor, wow. Um, and I'm going to uh, give credit because this was, I found this through, through user Gexwing on the uh, this is a pretty old, August 2012, so this has been around a while. But um, I found this on the Blender Artist Forum, and he provided this node node setup that is beautiful for, for faking IES lights. Um, and it, let me remind myself, it's a geometry node, normal, incoming, dot product, and a light fall off. Okay, I think I remember that now. So we've got input geometry converter vector math. The operation is dot product. Don't even, I, I offer no insight into what this math is actually doing. And I wanna say it was normal and incoming. Normal and incoming. All right, and from here we go into a vector 
or no, I color, I'm sorry, converter color ramp. Take that value in there. All right, now plug this up to the emission of our lamp. We've got our lamp selected and we're in the material editor. All right, um, but with the color ramp by itself, if I start to adjust this, you can see what it's doing to the light over here in the scene. So if we start adding a bunch of, let's make that one gray, let's control click on a flag makes it, or duplicates it, control click on it. So as I add a bunch of flags in here, you'll start to see that we get a pattern. Now, um, this is, I'm showing you like what it looks like in the actual scene, and this is not a good example. If we imitate his a little more closely, we can take a mental snapshot, because that one does look pretty cool. And it's something more like this. Let's get rid of that one. So anyway, his looked something like this. You had a bunch of flags and it starts to create that, that uh, IES effect. Now, if I switch to the, um, if I add an actual mesh plane by itself and kind of show you what this looks like against a flat plane. You can get a better idea of what it's creating. Now, right now it's blown out a little too much. Um, but that, that little bit of, of variety goes a long way for that IES type effect. Oh, there it is. Um, now, another thing he does is he adds, he or she adds a, where is it? It's color, for some reason, color light fall off. And he uses the quadratic into the strength. And then here we can, we can tone down the values. Yeah, so anyway, it's really fun actually to play with these. Highly recommend that you do so. It's pretty cool. All right, so we have this nice IES effect. Let's get rid of that plane. All right, so that's just gonna add a, a unique kind of, what if I should make this a circle too? Oh, you can't, that must be in 2.8. Um, but now if I duplicate this light, well, first I wanna make it a little bit warmer. Lamp, oh, the color. That's right, I need to do that in the node editor now. Shift A, color, mix RGB. That's <laughs> way too warm. There we go. Something more like that. All right, now I can duplicate around the scene. We'll make them linked. And anyway, so that's how you create the IES. Definitely play around with them. It's a lot of fun. And the situation, you know, it depends on the situation for how noticeable that effect is. So now we've kind of turned it into more of a nighttime scene. Although I'm curious what that does look like with everything. And then if we turn on our environment. It stands to reason we can start to dial down some of the global illumination perhaps. All right, let's do a render like that. Slot number seven. I will not keep you too much longer. Yeah, it does look pretty, it's fun. I don't know, this isn't a great render, but hopefully you're learning some tips and tricks. Um, 
What was the other thing I wanted to show? I didn't go over portal lights. Is anyone interested in portal lights? Because to me, it did not do anything for my scene. In fact, yeah, I'm just going to tell you, Jonathan Lampel, he works for us now. Uh, Blender portal lights. This one right here, reduce cycles noise with portal lights, even though that did not happen in my scene. Um, he goes over, he, he, he shows how to use portal lights very well. So I highly recommend this video for if you want to set up portal lights. For me, it did not do anything. It only works with the environment light, does not work with lamp objects themselves. So be aware of that. Um, so I'm just going to bypass the um, that particularly. So yeah, we do lose a little bit. Um, we definitely lose a little bit by cranking down the ambient occlusion or the uh, global illumination bounces. I feel like it should be maybe 32. Kind of split the difference. It was at 128. Well, 64 would be truly splitting the difference. But then also maybe increasing these, the, the, the minimum. Yeah, so play around with those. At this point, to clean it up, we just need to add more samples. Um, yeah, we just need to add more samples. Um, I think that's going to be it for this demo. Uh, I do want to go over for Yukino. Oh, let me see if it was a question. Oh, I'm sorry you can hear it. My kid woke up. Uh, sorry for the baby. Baby cries. Uh, do you happen to remember one of your first tutorials about creating glass from scratch? You did a trick to create fake caustics based on. Yes, I do remember that. That's going to be a little too complex to set up right now. Um, where is that? I, I need to go over that again. Um, I don't know. I, I'll, I'm not going to do it today, but at some point I do need to go over that again. Um, it's, a, it's an awesome trick. I, I can show you where to find it. Tube open movie caustics. There it is. So that's the, um, I'm going to post the link. This is, this is the trick from the source. That link uh, talks about the fake caustics. Very, very cool trick. Highly recommend it. Um, and then for Yukino, the last thing I'll do is go over that, that texture space situation. Um, all right, let me see if I can recreate it from scratch. All right, so I'm going to create several objects in here. Mesh, monkey, um, cone, and then scale them around. And I think what I what I think this does is uh, it sh so I'm going over the uh, Yukino. This was your question about texture space specifically, um, and then I'm gonna call I'm gonna call it quits for today. But new material, copy the material to both to, to all the objects. And I'm going to add, we're gonna, oh, I need to go to cycles. I'm going to add an input texture. Um, well, let's just use a uh, noise texture. That's yeah, gonna be fine. Um, Node Wrangler, turn that back on. I'm not sure why it turned off. All right, let's look in the viewport. So, yeah, if I want all of these objects to share the exact same texture space, right? You can tell that the material, even though it's sharing the same material, the the uh, frequency of the noise is a different value. Color converter, color ramp. All right. You should be able to tell that the black spot is bigger on this than it is over here. And as you scale it way down, let's see, if I tab into edit mode, interesting. All right, so we've got the same material, different textures, and I think all the objects, let me try and 
zero them out. Control A scale. So they all have the right, the, they all are scaled at one. They're applied scales, but the texture is not uh, the same across all objects. And the reason for that, if you go to the uh, object data panel under texture space, it's the auto texture space option. All right, we need to disable that really for all objects. So I'm gonna select everything, alt click on auto texture space, and then alt for each one of these values, size, I'm gonna go down to one, alt click on the next one, size down to one, alt click size down to one. And then for location, again, alt click zero, alt click zero, alt click zero. All right, at this point, our, our, all of our text, all of our objects are sharing the exact same texture space and the material is consistent. The texture is consistent between the two. Does that make sense? So that, that auto texture space is the issue, uh, Yukino. Uh, cool. All right. I think that's it. Sorry, I feel like I got a little bit off the rails with uh, towards the latter part of the demo, but I hope you guys uh, got some tips and tricks about lighting your uh, environment. Definitely lean on the course from Jonathan Williamson um, about lighting. And again, like I really don't find this stuff difficult. Uh, the the um, architectural visualization, the lighting placement makes sense. Um, the fact that you have global illumination on with cycles makes sense. And uh, it's just a lot less of a mystery to create that kind of realistic ArcViz lighting. Um, I'll keep an eye on the forum, see if you guys are getting it. I mean, you've, you've kind of already practiced it in week one from the uh, interior, uh, the day and night scene. So I really want to see what you guys do uh, this week. Um, convince me, make completely believable renders, please. Uh, that is going to be my criteria for judging. And um, yeah. Explore that photorealism, and I will see you in the forum. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Goodbye.